Hello and welcome. My name is Alan Burgess. Welcome to this DVD, the complete guide to river mouth salmon fishing. River mouth salmon fishing is not the most productive in terms of hours spent per fish caught. As salmon begin their journey upstream, they generally travel fairly quickly in through the mouth and up through the lower river. In the middle and upper reaches, where the river can be quite shallow in parts, they tend to hold up in deeper holes, either resting or waiting for a flood before continuing their journey across difficult shallow braids to the next holding pool. The salmon's biggest concern is to avoid becoming stranded as it makes its final journey upriver to spawn. It is these deeper upstream holding pools where the salmon are more concentrated that many of the fish are caught. However, I enjoy river mouth fishing, particularly in the company of mates. The river mouth is always changing, something is always going on. There's always the chance of catching a sea run trout or a kawai as well. The real key to river mouth fishing for salmon is to be there as a run of fish are going through. At such times, the fishing can be incredibly productive and very exciting. On this DVD, we'll look at getting the basics right first. Then, as it is with most sports, if you can get the basics right, success is much more likely. Salmon return to the same river where they were born, having spent anywhere from one to four years at sea. After an upriver journey of some 70 kilometres or more, the female lays up to 5,000 eggs in a nest called a red, excavated in the gravel bed of a high country stream branching off the main river. The hen salmon guards the nest holding station in the river until she is too weak to continue and then dies. The male, having driven off competitors, fertilises the eggs and may move on in search of other females. He also dies soon afterwards. The bodies of the parent fish add a nutrient-rich food source to the stream for the benefit of their young. Fertilised ova, or eggs, incubate in the stream bed for around nine weeks, depending on water temperature. Young salmon remain in the spawning stream for three to four months before beginning their migration towards the sea. First by heading down to the main river, where they remain for at least another three months, before finally heading out through the river mouth and into the sea with its rich food supply. Attempts to introduce Chinook salmon into New Zealand date back to the 1870s. Successful runs were finally established by 1905. The government's then Chief Inspector of Fisheries, Lake Aysen, decided that rather than just releasing a few salmon smolt into different rivers here and there, he would instead concentrate his efforts on just one river. Aysen decided that the Waitaki offered the best chance of success and a hatchery was constructed at Hakataramia, a tributary near Kurao, and the first shipment of over arrived in 1901 from the McLeod River in California. By 1905, the first salmon were being caught at the Waitaki River mouth, and by 1907, when importation ceased, over two million over had been hatched at Hakataramia. Those self-sustaining salmon fisheries have become well established between the Waiar River in North Canterbury and the Clutha River in Otago, and small runs in the Paringa, Taranakara and Hokitika rivers on the west coast. Attempts to establish salmon runs in other parts of New Zealand have failed. 
The successful establishment of self-sustaining salmon runs in Canterbury is probably because uh, the habitat closely resembles that of the salmon's native North America. The Canterbury Salmon Rivers are notably shorter than those in North America, which may help to explain why salmon in New Zealand don't grow as large as the same species does there. A bigger body is an advantage for adult salmon, negotiating very long rivers to reach their spawning grounds. Availability of food sources at sea is also crucial. All salmonids grow rapidly and to a larger size if a quality food supply is readily available. In a study published by Gavin James of Niwa, the stomach contents of 800 salmon caught at sea off the Canterbury coast showed that 99% of their diet consisted of just three species, sprats 76%, red krill 18% and juvenile houghton 5%. Sprats and red krill are virtually the only suitable prey species present off the Canterbury coast for salmon to eat during the summer months. This goes a long way towards explaining why the uh, annual salmon runs are so variable in size. The abundance of pelagic red krill and sprats is known to vary greatly from year to year, which may affect the size and condition of salmon taken by anglers each fishing season. Salmon fishery enhancement has always been a numbers game. Of the 5,000 eggs laid in the red, Less than half a dozen will reach full maturity and survive to return to the river to breed and complete the cycle. The hatchery is a positive step in the right direction. It supplies eyed over for planting in other waters, along with trout and salmon for stocking North Canterbury lakes. In particular, the Groins fishing lakes, which are set aside for junior anglers. There can be wild fluctuations in the numbers of salmon returning to spawn. Such fluctuations have so far proved impossible to predict. The emphasis for fish and game with hatchery rearing is on propping up the salmon fishery during tough years. The actual numbers of salmon raised and released by fish and game has very little effect on the fishery overall. In poor years, angler catch rates can reach as high as 60% of fish returning to the Waimakariri River. However, it is important to keep in mind that huge fluctuations in the numbers of salmon returning to spawn each season is a fact of life that has always been the case since the Chinook salmon fishery was first established in New Zealand early last century. The unpredictability of each new season is all part of the allure and the excitement of salmon fishing. Next up, we have the fixed spool or egg beater reel. Now, not many guys use these. Uh, quite a few people will start off with an egg beater and then move on to a, uh, a um, free spool reel. But an egg beater still has its uses, and I, I've caught a lot of fish on this. This is an old uh, Daiwa Regal reel, and uh, I've got it uh, in a combination here with a, an old uh, Kilwell Quinat 90, this rod that I've had for, I think, since the mid-80s. It's quite heavy. It's a quite a, a heavy combination compared to uh, the more modern lightweight graphite ones. But it has a considerable advantage in that if you're fishing the gut or near the mouth 
uh, and you cast into a headwind, there's no chance whatsoever of getting a bird's nest. In certain situations, um, it can be just the thing to still use, even if you do have a, uh, a free spool wheel. Now, the next rod and reel I have is this Berkeley Gorilla Stick, and it's teamed up with a Shakespeare uh, medalist. Quite an interesting uh, little combination that I've had for quite a while. And I think if I were going out to buy a brand new uh, sort of general purpose salmon rod, I think this is the sort of thing I would go for. This is an, an 8 foot 6 rod, so it's uh, reasonably long, so you can get quite a good bit of casting distance with it. Uh, it's graphite, so it's and it's quite thin, so it cuts the air quite easily as it goes through, and you can cast quite a good distance with it. It is a two-piece. It is a two-piece, um, and it is a very good little sort of combination that you can use just about for anything. You can cast into the surf. You can cast in the gut. Uh, good for fishing the lower river. A good general-purpose rod and reel combination. Now the thumb release works by you place the heel of your thumb on the release lever and then the tip of your thumb down onto the spool and then push the thumb uh, lever down with the heel of your thumb and then it's ready to cast all in the one action. Now the next rod and reel combo that we're going to look at is this uh, Ambassador 6500. Now the Ambassador 6500 would be the biggest selling salmon reel in New Zealand by far. It's not hugely expensive, uh, it's got ball bearings, lasts forever, you can get readily get more pawls and uh, extra parts, bearings and so forth, and they last and last and last and they just keep on going. I've had this one for many years and caught quite a few fish on it. And I've got it in combination here with a Shimano Katana rod, and this is quite a, a lightweight rod. It's only seven feet long, and it's nice and light, and I can I can cast away with it all day long. And it's uh, despite the fact that it looks relatively flimsy, it will of course take any fish, no matter how big the salmon is. And this is a, a very good combination, particularly the reel. You can't go wrong with with a, a an Ambassador 6500. Now in casting with this reel, what I do is put my thumb on the spool and then reach over with my other hand and push the uh, reel release button and now I'm ready to cast. And then after I've cast out, I wind the handle and uh, the lever pops back up again. So I've got my thumb on it and I reach over and I push it, cast and then wind and it pops back up again. This is a typical um, upriver reel, a typical reel that you would use for fishing the gut. Uh, you could use it as a, as a, um, as a, as a light surf reel, uh, but it, the 6500 is an excellent reel for salmon fishing and one of the biggest sellers. Now we come to the big boys. This is the Kilwell Enticer 1200TW. TW stands for Twill Weave. And it's designed to cast from 40 grams up to 85 grams. So you can cast quite heavy uh, weight forward ticers with this when this is what you get the really huge long casts out over the surf. Because we're fishing in the surf and we've got to get more distance and we may in fact hook the fish 100 meters out we're using a specialist larger uh, Abu Garcia 7000 reel. Now this reel holds some 300 meters of 20 pound line. Now what might happen when we're when we're salmon fishing if we cast out say 100 or possibly even a wee bit more of 100 meters and then we hook a fish and the fish is moving off, that's a lot of line out and the spool diameter would release, to, would sorry, reduce too much if we had a smaller reel 
with less line on it. Now you can see this reel holds a 300 odd metres of uh, 20 pound monofilament and it works in much the same way as the smaller 6500 in that you have to put your thumb on the uh, spool to get ready to cast and then use your other hand to push the release lever. And then you cast and after you've cast out you wind the handle and put it back into gear. Like most salmon reels it has a level wind on the front. Now that's very very useful because it means that the line is guided across evenly on the spool. I put my thumb on here and I put it out of gear and we can see that the uh, when I take my thumb off the uh, Z spinner just drops down quite quickly. I wind it back up again. Now in order to stop getting bird's nests what we do is we tighten the little knob on the end. We tighten that up and then when I take my put it put it into gear and I take my thumb off you see it doesn't drop. And then what we do is we loosen we loosen it, loosen the knob until it just starts to drop. Or, or it'll only drop if I give it a shake. See? I'm going to put my put it in, in, into out of gear rather. And now if I give it a couple of shakes, it'll drop down. Now what happens there is when I cast, I'm much less likely to get a bird's nest here because too much line's coming off. And then after you've made a dozen or two casts with it quite tight like that, then you can just slacken it off, say a 1 8 turn, slacken the knob off a 1 8 turn, which takes the pressure off the end of the spool, and it'll enable you to get a little bit further. But if you start off with that fairly tight, and then um, reduce it after so many casts, you'll find that you'll get the hang of using the reel, uh, but you won't get all those bird's nests. And the first job I like to do is prepare my rod so that it doesn't fly apart when I'm casting. And to do that, we rub candle grease, candle wax, on the inside of the join. Then, when we join the two parts together, we'll get a nice snug fit. There we go. Very good. The best monofilament line to use for salmon fishing on free spool reels is 0.42mm to 0.45mm diameter. Using a lighter line doesn't actually increase casting distance. Don't overload your spool with too much line or you'll have all sorts of casting problems. Two millimetres from the top is about right. Many salmon surf anglers, myself included, squeeze a few extra metres casting distance by removing two of the four brake blocks from their Ambassador 7000 reels. This works very well, but don't take out all four blocks or you'll get too many bird's nests. percent of the salmon caught in New Zealand South Island are taken on silver Z spinners. These spoons are stamped from brass sheet and come in various weights. The most popular are 22 and 28 grams. And you can go even smaller with Z spinners when the river is very clear. By far the most popular finish is bright electro silver plating. However, in the past decade or so, I've probably caught more salmon on white or yellow Z spinners than the traditional silver ones. I believe that the effectiveness of Z spinners is improved by the addition of a second colour flash, especially green or a red plastic tag. Despite the dominance of the Z spinner, some anglers fish with different shaped spoons, such as these short fast action teardrop models. The black one is used in discoloured water. 
a longer salmon spoon, pictured at the top, has a slower loping swimming action. Many of these older spoons are now no longer readily available. A good alternative to the Z spinner, which is readily available, is the excellent Killwell Quicksilver. I've had great success with the double Z spinner at the mouth of the Waimakariri River. Here the river can be wide, but not particularly fast moving. The extra weight of the double zeddy enables you to cover a lot more water. The Tysa, or Hex Wobbler, is designed for long distance casting out over the surf. It is seldom used for river fishing, except perhaps at the mouth of the Waimakariri River. These guys are all fishing with Tysas. When fishing the surf, greater casting distance often equates to more hookups. On some days, the only salmon taken are caught by those anglers able to cast far enough out to reach them. When fishing a Tysa in the sea, it is important to wind faster than you would when fishing with a zeddy in the river. There are two reasons for this. Firstly, salmon will be up off the bottom in the sea, as unlike when they're swimming in a river current, there's no energy saving to be made by hugging the bottom. And secondly, a Tysa has very little swimming action when retrieved at low speed. Whereas once everyone fished with silver Tysas, nowadays white, yellow and green painted models are common and surprisingly effective at taking fish. Almost everyone applies a strip of prism tape for added flash. I've been successful with strips of green, yellow, and particularly the uh, bright yellow chartreuse prism tape. I now only fish with weight forward tices. These have a small piece of brass brazed on at the hook end to prevent them from tumbling in flight, which robs you of casting distance. The weight forward versions fly like a dart. Next up is the Colorado Spoon. Colorado Spoons are popular with some anglers, whilst most never use them. The blade spins on its axis like a propeller, producing plenty of sound and flash, even at quite low speed. This is very attractive to predatory fish. However, they can only be fished with a lead weight on the line. They are good for getting down to the bottom to cover deep holes when river fishing. I've also seen them used successfully at McIntosh's Rocks on the lower Waimakariri River. They're also used quite a bit to fish the Waitaki River gut when the river is running high. The smaller the blade, the less water resistance. There's no need to wind in quickly with a Colorado spoon as the spinning blade does all the work of attracting salmon. The disadvantage of the Colorado is the constant snagging on the bottom from the lead weight. When used in the right situation though, they're deadly fish takers, but they lack the versatility of the Z spinner. A good quality pair of split ring pliers are essential equipment for salmon fishing. With these you can remove a dull hook and replace it with a sharp one in just seconds. I prefer French made VMC hooks in sizes 1 or 2. They cost around about a dollar each, so carry plenty of spare hooks. Prism tape can be fixed to a lure very quickly, without the need to cut it to the exact shape. Just cut strips from a sheet, and then cut the strips to length. Peel off the backing, and stick the tape to the lure. Finally, trim to shape by sliding a sharp blade all around the edge of the lure. Another good idea is to gather all your old tices together at the end of the season remove the hardware and send them all off to be re-silvered. If this job looks too fiddly, many of the leading tackle stores sell prism tape conveniently pre-cut to shape.
salmon takes can be few and far between. Don't risk losing a good fish because your hooks are dull. Salmon have very hard mouths. A small metal file is the best thing to sharpen fish hooks. A couple of strokes with the file from the direction of the point is all that is needed to restore the sticky sharpness of this VMC travel. At the main east coast river mouths, excluding the Waimakariri, the walk from the car park to the river mouth proper can be anywhere from 1 to 4 kilometres, all over loose stones. Adding to your walking discomfort would be a heavy day's supply of food, drink and fishing tackle. And if you were lucky enough to catch a couple of big salmon, your return journey would be burdened with even more heavy weight. In the past, beach buggies, often fashioned from chopped down old cars, were very popular. Nowadays, quad bikes have almost completely taken over as beach transport for salmon fishing. They are cheap to purchase, you can get a quad bike and a trailer to carry it to the beach for as little as two to three thousand dollars. They are quite safe to ride, provided you take it easy, and perhaps their greatest advantage is the ability to quickly travel down to the mouth for a bit of a quick look, while at the same time they make it possible to carry plenty of extra rods, tackle and creature comforts, with virtually no possibility of getting stuck. Not to mention they provide a good seat or something to lean on in an otherwise featureless landscape. Full-size 4x4 trucks are nowhere near as capable as quad bikes when it comes to travel over loose shingle at river mouths. Their greater weight causes them to sink easily and once stuck to their axles in loose stones, particularly when on a slope, they are very difficult to extract. This Toyota Hilux has been modified for beach use with extra wide tyres and a body lift kit. It is much more capable than it would be otherwise Note also that it has its tyres deflated to only about 12 pounds per square inch. They appear almost flat. Letting the air out makes them even wider, spreading the load and reducing ground pressure. This makes the truck ride on top of the stones rather than sinking down into them. Driver ability and experience plays an important part as well. The inexperienced 4x4 driver tends to rev the engine, believing they are less likely to get stuck if they go fast. This is not so at all. The best method is to let the vehicle idle its way over the stones, trying not to spin the wheels even when going up a slope. You can see here the advantage of extra body height. Without this modification, the truck could easily become stuck on its belly, in which case you'd have to get out and work with a shovel to free it. You must, of course, carry a portable compressor to pump the tyres back up before going onto hard ground, otherwise the tyres could easily roll from the rims when cornering. Overall, I still prefer the quad bike to living in fishing. It is a far cheaper option, and although this uh, Hilux is very capable, sooner or later it will either get stuck or suffer an expensive repair. Mind you, it is big enough to sleep in quite comfortably, an important consideration for overnight salmon fishing trips. For up river fishing, where stones are usually more firmly packed. A 4x4 truck is excellent for covering the greater distances required. Water crossings are always a worry. Change down to a lower gear and maintain a constant speed.
Another danger in 4x4 driving on Canterbury riverbeds is that the rivers can rise rapidly following rain in the distant mountains. You may have driven out onto a riverbed in the morning through a side strip that was only halfway up your wheels. On the return journey, later that afternoon, the same side screen might now be halfway up your windows and be fast and impassable. 4x4s are lost in Canterbury from time to time for just this reason. Whenever you are fishing on the riverbeds, wet stones are a sign the river is dropping. Dry stones could mean the opposite. Some anglers carry a few painted stones in their pocket and place one at the water's edge where they are fishing to use as a gauge. If you notice the river is rising rapidly, it is time to beat a retreat. Jet boats are much more useful for finding fish in the middle and upper reaches of the main rivers, where salmon are more likely to be holding in pools. In the lower river, where salmon tend to be on the move, it is more a case of finding a good spot and sitting on it all day. These same spots in the lower river can usually be accessed with a 4x4 vehicle or on foot. reaches. It often carries between 300 and 500 cubic metres of water spilled from the hydro electricity generating dams upstream. These high flows can make access to the main channel difficult without a boat. So on the white happy water especially, salmon angles with jet boats have a huge advantage. Jet boats are obviously expensive to own, operate and insure. A smaller outboard jet boat can be useful for fishing the river mouth lagoons, making it possible to reach those few good spots that you can't get to on foot. Hut owners on the north side of the river mouth also use them to get over to the preferred south side. Most importantly, jet boats require skill and knowledge to operate well. At least a few are lost in the Waitaki River most years after entanglement in willows and the like. If you are considering buying one, the best advice I can give you is to make as many trips as you can with someone who has one. The lower tidal reaches of the Waimakariri are quite different again. This is the only place where you can operate a propeller-driven craft safely. Indeed, I have been very successful fishing for salmon from an anchored boat at McIntosh's Hull two kilometres upriver from the mouth. On several occasions, I've caught limit bags from the boat when over a hundred shore anglers haven't hooked a fish. Finally, there are almost no concrete boat ramps on the main salmon rivers. A 4x4 truck is essential to launch and retrieve from a rough shimmer riverbed.
to fishing the lower braids is to remember that the salmon's biggest concern as it heads upstream to spawn is to avoid becoming stranded or running up a dead end. As they pass up through the river gut, they may slow down to rest just a little if the gut is running very quickly, but generally speaking, they'll continue upstream straight away. The salmon will be looking for the main flow of the river, as this offers the least likelihood of becoming stranded or inadvertently heading up a side stream or tributary where it doesn't want to go. To this end, it makes sense that we concentrate our fishing efforts on the main river flow, where the largest volume of water is concentrated. The best time to fish is from the third day after a flood onwards. The salmon will still be on the move, so it's best to stick to a good pool on the river and fish it all day. The trouble is, at that time of year in particular, and in the lower river, almost everyone else has the same idea. Looking across the Lakaia Lagoon from the south side of the mouth, we can see the gut starts here and runs just a short distance to enter the sea at the other end here. The gut is the narrow fast flowing channel where the river makes its final exit from the lagoon to the sea. It is an interesting place to fish, there's always something happening. Even if you don't catch a fish yourself, you're sure to see any that are taken. Sometimes the gut can be quite long, as here, in this view of the lower Waitaki River, where an enormous 500 cubic metres of water are passing in front of these salmon anglers every second. The gut can also be very short, as here, in this view, at the mouth of the Rakaia River. Depending on the time of year, there will also be white bait in the gut, along with silveries, sea-run brown trout, kawai, yellow-eyed mullet, and salmon. The mouths of the main Canterbury salmon rivers are constantly on the move, as a result of two powerful but opposing natural forces. On the one hand, the might of the river flowing down to the sea, while at the same time, pounding waves pile up loose shingle to block off the river's escape. During periods of low river flow, the shingle spit extends northward, and the gut often becomes long and thin, with the sea's crashing waves gaining the upper hand. Following rain, the swollen river will punch a new, shorter, more direct exit to the sea. Sometimes, the gut can suddenly change position by several kilometres overnight. For a time, there may even be two guts though the older, smaller one soon closes without the force of water passing through to keep it open. At high tide, the lagoon also swells in size because the river's flow is being held back by the sea. Then, as the tide drops, water drains from the lagoon like a giant bathtub. With the falling tide, the speed of the water flowing through the gut increases considerably. The lower braids, covered by the lagoon at high tide, become exposed as the tide falls. Salmon and sea-run trout anglers will change their fishing position to best match the stage of the tide at a particular river mouth. If, for example, depending on sea conditions, they may start off fishing the surf at the bottom and during the first half of the incoming tide, and then move back to fish the gut with a lure rod during the second half of the incoming tide and as the tide begins falling. 
some parts of the lower river become more or less attractive to both fish and anglers as the tide rises and falls. A stretch of narrow shallow water, not worth fishing at low tide, becomes a different proposition entirely as the lagoon backs up with the new incoming tide. Regardless of the time, first light in the morning is always the best time to fish the gut. Choosing the best position along the gut to fish only comes with experience. Often the salmon all seem to be hooked in a certain small area. This spot is usually obvious from the concentrated crowd of anglers all trying to fish shoulder to shoulder. Salmon travelling through the gut won't be stopping. They'll be moving and swimming close to the bottom in all the same energy. To catch them, you must be fishing your Z-spin right down the bottom. With the gut flowing very quickly, the best place to fish will often be the flat water, just above where it drops off steeply. Salmon may slow down a bit here after having just negotiated the swiftest part of the gut. As mentioned earlier, there can be sea run trout, kawai and salmon all present at the same time. Particularly when fishing feathered lures, you have a very good chance of hooking any one of these with every cast. At times, the gut can be a crowded place to fish. For many though, this is all part of the attraction. Fishing side by side with mates, the sound of powerful jet boat engines, squawking turns and gulls, the wind and the constant roar of the river and adjacent surf are all part of the experience. Salmon trout and kawai nearly always head downstream when hooked. Your best option is to head in that direction along with them and play the fish in the slack water at the end of the spit or around into the surf allowing the waves to carry the fish up onto the beach. The Waimakariri river mouth doesn't have surf fishing in the usual sense. The gut area where most of the fishing is centred is shallow and wide, with a sandy bottom instead of the typical shingle. The best time to fish the Waimakariri river gut is the top half of the outgoing tide, when there's more river current for the salmon to swim against. Overall, the gut is a bit of a hit and miss place to fish for salmon. The number one secret to fishing it is to be there when a run of fish are passing through. Salmon caught fresh from the surf are bright silver in colour and full of fight. They will have only recently stopped feeding and so be in top physical condition. The surf is an inconsistent place to fish for salmon. Sometimes it can really fire with large numbers of salmon being caught over a short period. At other times it can be frustratingly unfishable for days on end due to rough sea conditions. And then, when the sea is calm enough, the fish may either not be there, not be biting, or be out of range. It is important to keep in mind that sometimes surf fishing can be good when the river is dirty. At other times, the reverse can be true. A southerly blow can render the surf unfishable while the river is still clear.
Experienced salmon anglers fish the river and gut, but also carry a long surf rod should the sea conditions improve sufficiently to warrant casting. A few blokes seem more dedicated to surf fishing than others and will always be first to start hurling a ticer out to sea even when conditions seem far from ideal. On occasion, these early surf casters pick up a salmon despite the rough looking sea conditions, which suggests it is always worth having a few casts, as there may be a layer of dirty fresh water on the surface with clearer seawater underneath. Timing plays an important part in successful surf fishing. When the river level is either very low or very high, salmon tend to congregate in the surf, waiting for river conditions to improve. Amazingly, I've experienced some of my best salmon fishing on the south side of the Rangitata river mouth, when the river itself was in the flood. The tide along the east coast tends to carry dirty river water north. This often leaves a pocket of clear blue water close into shore on the south side of the mouth. Some years, in Canterbury, the summer months can be extremely dry. The salmon rivers get very low and the water too warm and clear. In these conditions, salmon tend to hang around waiting in the surf for a fresh before running the river. Anglers can often see these fish porpoising in the waves. Those that aren't caught soon after they arrive off the river mouth seem to become immune to tices and take no notice of them. Interestingly, at the Rangitata river mouth, in these low river conditions, perhaps several dozen salmon will be caught each day from the surf, usually around low tide, with little or no action for the rest of the day. The tide is important when surf fishing. At the mouth of the Rakaia and Rangitata rivers, the best time to fish is near the bottom of the outgoing and the first half of the incoming tide. During this period it is possible to cast further out to sea and often to reach deeper water. The mouth and lower reaches of the Waimakariri River, where I often fish, are quite different again. The best time to fish there is the top half of the outgoing tide when the salmon will have a bit of current to swim against. Finally, when fishing the surf, it is important to wind your reel faster than you would in river fishing. As salmon will have no current to swim against in the sea, there's no reason for them to hug the bottom. They'll be higher in the water, so you need to wind faster. Tices are also fairly lifeless, and less retrieved faster than a Z spinner. The ability to make very long casts is an essential skill for successful salmon beach fishing. On some days, the anglers able to make the longest casts are the only ones who catch fish. Salmon surf anglers are highly competitive. There's always a sort of informal, if unmentioned, distance casting contest going on at the river mouth. To compete in this silent contest, you need a top quality rod and reel. When casting in the line, it is specially important to cast straight out from the beach. If you accidentally cast on an angle, you tend to get tangled with other anglers' lines. The most popular spot to cast is at the end of the spit closest to the river. However, not all the salmon are caught there. You still have a good chance anywhere in the line. The 
The Canterbury Lure Rod is a unique local fishing method designed to get feathered lures down to the bottom quickly in fast flowing rivers. It is not fly fishing in the traditional sense. Its biggest advantage over spin fishing is that the line is fished through the hands. As your line swings around in the river, you can feel every little touch on the bottom and change of current. You can tell where the slack water is, where fish might be holding, from the feel of the line alone. Another advantage of lure fishing is that your lures are close to the bottom, where the salmon will be, throughout the cast. There's no waiting for the lures to slowly sink down. The next cast can be made the moment your lure clears the surface. Changing to a lighter or heavier weight makes it possible to fish different water depths. With lure fishing, you build up a gentle, relaxing rhythm of casting and retrieving that, after a time, becomes almost automatic. It is surprising just how addictive it is once you get started. Each angler employs a slightly different technique that best suits them. In order to give lure fishing a go, you need to have the proper lure fishing rod. With this form of fishing, the rod does all the work. Many will wonder, of course, whether this form of fishing will suit them, and so are hesitant to commit to purchasing the equipment needed. Fishing the Canterbury lure rod enables you to fish for salmon as the river is clearing after a flood earlier than spin anglers can with Z spinners. This allows the lure rod fishermen more days on the river each season. The main disadvantage of lure rod fishing is that you will get a higher percentage of foul hooked trout and salmon. At least twice as many fish will be foul hooked as with spinning gear. When you do foul hook a fish, try to break it off as quickly as possible. You can generally tell if a fish is foul hooked because there'll be no head shaking and you can't turn the fish towards you. Occasionally, foul hooked salmon will also jump clear of the water. Legally hooked salmon and sea run trout taken on the lure rod invariably head downstream towards the sea and are hard to stop. All you can do is run after them and play them in the surf whenever possible. I enjoy lure rod fishing immensely. It is the ideal method to target sea run trout in the lower Rakaia, Rangitata and Waitaki rivers, particularly in the evenings from November to March. When targeting salmon, uh, fish your gear down close to the bottom. Yellow lures are the most popular, but salmon will also readily take the other Canterbury patterns as well. This is my Canterbury lure rod. It's made by Composite Developments and it's uh, nine and a half feet long and has an action very similar to an old fiberglass fly rod. I've got it matched up with an LV saltwater fly reel. And that's an excellent little reel. It has a fiberglass spool, a stainless steel back, very, very strong. You can palm the reel to slow down the fish. And it also has a, uh, a, a drag system. And, uh, and most importantly, the, uh, the handle is uh, works on an anti-reverse so you don't get whacked in the knuckles with it when a fish makes a run. I've got the, uh, the reel spooled up with um, 60 pound monofilament. And the reason we're using 60 pound monofilament is as we strip the line through your fingers, it doesn't cut in as it would with uh, lighter line. At the business end, We've got here D leads with a swivel, and I'm using uh, oval split rings and another swivel at the end. And the reason we use a daisy chain of leads is because uh, that's less likely to snag. Now, I've got two leaders on here, two traces rather, and uh, these should be around about, or oh, two metres long, but I've got them a little bit shorter here just to show you. And on the end of each one I've got Yellow Lady tied with rabbit pelts. Salmon fishing 
as a highly competitive sport. A large number of anglers are competing against one another to catch a fairly small number of fish. In fact, most years there are far more license holders in North Canterbury than there are salmon entering the rivers for them to catch. According to Fish and Game's own estimate, there were just 1,110 salmon caught in the Rakaia River during the 2006-2007 season. But there were at least 10 times as many fishing licenses sold in the North Canterbury Fish and Game region. That means many salmon anglers caught very few fish, and the great majority caught none. What always happens with salmon fishing in Canterbury is that a surprisingly small number of anglers catch a disproportionately large percentage of the fish. I would go so far as to say that as few as 100 Canterbury anglers catch as many salmon each season as all the other Canterbury anglers combined. There are several reasons why this is so. Firstly, only a small number of successful anglers get the opportunity to fish hard during the peak of the salmon fishing season. By this I mean they have the time to go fishing, they either live close to the river or they have the transport available to get there whenever they wish. Secondly, they have the knowledge needed to be in the right place at the right time and use the most productive fishing methods based on experience. Whereas for most people salmon fishing is an entirely hit and miss affair. However, luck plays little part in it, with the same people getting into double figures almost every year, regardless of the number of salmon returning to our rivers. When fishing the gut, try to keep your zip spinner on the bottom for as long as possible during each cast. Many start winding too soon before the lure has sunk down to the bottom and then wind much too fast so that the lure planes quickly back up to the surface. You see this mistake made quite often at McIntosh's Hole on the Waimakariri River. The more anxious they become at not catching a fish when others are, the faster they wind. If you watch the top anglers at McIntosh's, you'll notice that they wait for ages for the zeddy to sink right down, and then wind impossibly slowly. When you are fishing the river, or surf, and you can see fish being caught, try to keep your lure in the water and working as much as possible. Don't fall into the trap of standing around talking when you know the fish are there. Only a small number of salmon will run the river and be caught on any given day. Give yourself the best possible chance by having a shiny z-spinner, sharp hooks, fish close to the bottom, and keep your gear working in the strike zone as much as possible. Keep in mind that salmon are returning to the river solely to spawn and then die. To this end, they want to run the river when conditions are at their most favourable. This will be when there is sufficient river flow for the salmon to travel upstream without becoming stranded. The salmon are waiting for a flood. Unfortunately, you can't fish for salmon when the river is in flood because the fish won't be able to see your lure in the dirty water. The very best time to fish for salmon is just as the river is clearing after a flood has gone through. This is when the salmon will again be able to see your z-spinner. The river colour will be changing from brown to green. Aim to fish the river when the flow has stopped falling rapidly and has begun to stabilise. Conversely, the worst time to fish the river is during a period of low flows when the river is blue and the water warm. To the salmon, this spells danger with the possibility of becoming stranded in the shallow braids. You can use the internet and teletext to keep an eye on river flows and predict the best time to fish and also avoid wasted trips to flooded rivers.
With salmon lures costing as much as $4 each, I'll show you just how easy it is to tie your own. Tying your own lures not only saves a heap of money, it's also rewarding to catch salmon and trout on lures you've tied yourself. Let's tie a yellow lady salmon lure. This lure is easily the most popular one used for salmon and sea run trout fishing in New Zealand and South Island. To make it even easier to tie, I'm going to use a strip of dyed rabbit pelt for the wing instead of hackle feathers. The rabbit strip works just as well as the feathered version and the fish will never know the difference. I begin by underbinding the hook, then tie in a red tag of hackle fibres. You can also use teased knitting wool, which is cheaper and works just as well. Next, tie on the end of a length of oval silver tinsel. Strip the fibres back to reveal the thread in the centre of yellow or perhaps lime green chenille and tie in at the rear. I like to coat the hook with a liberal uh, amount of uh, head cement for added strength, but you can skip this if you wish. Wind the chenille along the hook to within about 3mm short of the head. Note I've used my scissors to taper the rabbit strip at both ends before tying it on at the head. Use hook sizes from 1 down to 4. Here I'm using a large size 1 Temco TMC 7999. I also like Blackmagic B2 2x Longshank hooks and uh, Kamazan B175s. Mostly I like to tie my uh, lures on size 2 hooks. Then I wrap the tinsel along Matuka style to secure the wing. Finally, a few strips of crystal flash for added sparkle, and then tie off. Your finished lure doesn't have to be perfect to catch fish. Tight lines, sea run trout and salmon lures are available in leading tackle stores for those anglers not inclined to tie their own. These are proven fish takers, and I just love the names. The yellow Brunton is the most popular. It's the same as the yellow lady, but without a red tag. And if I didn't tie my own lures, I would definitely buy these. Here is an excellent new salmon ticer called the Rocket. It's made in Christchurch by Amazing Baits. It's a weight forward model designed for maximum casting distance. This brass hex rod has been cut long ways on a shallow angle, leaving most of the weight still at one end. Like all really good ideas, the concept is amazingly simple, and these things cast for miles. This is a silvered version weighing 78 grams. There are also yellow, white and green powder coated and lighter 55 and 68 gram models in their range. The hook is a size 2 VMC connected with an oval split ring, which is just what you want. The people behind these tices are top Canterbury salmon anglers, and if you want to make really long distance beach casts with the big boys, then you need to get some of these new rockets from Amazing Baits.
available on the fishingmag.co.nz website is the top selling ebook or electronic book, The Complete Guide to Surf Casting. It contains 144 pages and features 160 full colour photographs and line drawings. Also available on the website is the ebook Trolling and Spin Fishing for Trout. Full details and extracts from these ebooks can be seen at fishingmag.co.nz.